right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you actually from a extremely rainy San Diego today. A bit unusual that uh, I normally say sunny San Diego today, I'm saying rainy San Diego. And I am delighted to be joined by Michael Libowitz, who I'm sure he's up in Concord in the, in the Bay Area. I'm sure it's equally yeah. rainy up there. Probably worse, actually. It's a little, it's a bit rainy here. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and Michael is the CEO of Magnetic Mind Studio, and his mission is to show business owners how to communicate meaningfully and effectively so that they can attract more of their ideal customers. Michael is an expert in the field of linguistics and behavioral neurology, and he works with businesses to craft message strategies to target how we are wired to feel resonance and attraction. And uh, you have a passion for understanding how the human mind works, and, and uh, you have created a fresh counterintuitive insight of how business can use specific language to trigger trust engagement and the decision to buy. And so what we're going to talk about today is, is Michael's hell yeah value proposition. How do you find your hell yeah value proposition so people take notice? So Michael, over to you. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated and intrigued to learn about your counterintuitive insights. Sure. Yeah, I'm going to give you the, uh, the very short tour. Uh, <laughs> This is all the neurology piece. So essentially, there's a part of our brain that's in charge of most of our decision making. In fact, all of it. And it's looking, it does just two things, uh, emotions and survival. Um, and one of the ways that this part of our brain is wired up to maintain survival is it compels us to want to be around people who are like ourselves, right? So we're always looking for like kind. When we see like kind, this part of our brain perceives no threat. And when it sees not like kind, oh my gosh, all the warning signals go up. So the name of the game is to communicate about your business and about what you do and how you can help your uh, clients and customers in a way that allows your audience to see like kind in you. And there's a very specific way this operates in our brain. And that specific way is this part of our brain just wants to know what you believe, which is one of the things that hardly any business owner actually talks about. We tend to talk about what we can do, the results and that sort of thing, which are important, mm -hmm. but we hardly ever talk about what we believe. And so there we mm -hmm. are talking about our business. Meanwhile, the part of the brain of your customer that's looking for the safety is going, trying to like sort through all the clues that you're dropping uh, to understand, are you like me or not? Just tell me the answer so I can feel comfortable <laughs> around you, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, it's, such an, it's such a, sorry, it's such an interesting, uh, interesting concept, isn't it? That, uh, you know, that our, our brains are searching for, for some way of, uh, as you say, for something in common, for something, for yeah. understanding who we are so we can relate to something. Because, yeah. as uh, you know, anytime you have a conversation, you meet a stranger. Like when my neighbor first moved in next door, the first time I bump into him, I happened to have an Arsenal football shirt on. He happened mm -hmm. to support Arsenal. Everything yeah. started off. Otherwise, to be honest, you know, <laughs> right. meeting new neighbors can be a little bit uh, awkward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is like anyone who says, hey, I, I have I never met my neighbors. And like, get a dog. <laughs> you, start yeah, yeah, yeah. The dog, you start meeting all the other neighbors who have a dog and you start talking about the dogs and next thing you know you have a whole community around you <laughs> yeah as well that's the that's the foundation that's the behavioral neurology now there's a whole bunch to it but the core of it is this foundation um and there a good message is made up of two things that your audience needs to hear and they kind of only need to hear these two things. Everything else is kind of like a eh, supporting cast member to these two main players. Number one is what's the main outcome I get from working with you? This is what their brain is asking you. And this connects to the part of the brain that I call the human brain. But it just wants to know, it wants to be oriented. Like, where am I with you? Right? Like, are, what are we talking about together? So when they have you have a clearly articulated outcome this part of the brain goes ah oh, now i know what we're talking about right and a little one word about outcomes uh came it comes from a quote from a gentleman named theodore levitt who's with the harvard business school he says people don't want a quarter inch drill 
what they want is a quarter inch hole. Right. Right. So your outcome may not necessarily be the thing you deliver. You might be selling the quarter inch drill, but what you're actually delivering is the quarter inch hole in this metaphor. So the question to your audience is, what is the outcome of what you do? What do they actually have once you've given them your service? So that talks to the human brain, but that's not part of the brain making the decision. Really, then the next thing is, do we share the same beliefs, which we already covered? And now we're talking directly to the critter brain. So now you give them what you believe. Yes, you're not a threat to my survival. Here's our outcome. Oh my gosh, we're on the same page. You're about 90% done with the sale at that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the rest and of just, logistics. And just, sorry, just, just yeah. even going back to what you believe in, though, I am... Um... That's a, that I, f I find that a really interesting one because there's so many people today talking about purpose and authenticity mm -hmm. and all of that, that it's become, it's, it's all sounds extremely inauthentic to me, <laughs> yeah. but there you go. Yeah. Um, but it does, it, but it does seem there is an under, it, they're starting to recognize that there's an underlying need in us. And I think mm -hmm. this has been, uh, exacerbated maybe by by covid and all of that but there's a there's a greater need now i think to trust and connect yes and, and to believe i'm working with somebody good as simple yes. i mean even as simple as that yeah this is the neurology of trust in fact you know that saying that the no like and trust you before they're gonna buy mm -hmm. uh and lots of people say oh it takes a while for them to trust you and you know you've heard sayings like well you have to have seven touch points before they'll buy or some version of that Sharing your belief system is the key to establishing trust. In fact, that seven touch points before they'll buy, all that's happening there is after the seventh touch point, the, the critter brain, which is what I call the part of the brain that's looking for safety, the critter brain realizes, you know what? I've been with this person seven times and I haven't died yet. Probably <laughs> can trust him now, <laughs> right? That's literally what's going on. But you can short circuit that. You can get that down to 3D or even one meeting uh, when done artfully and when you're very clear about your belief system, because that's all they're looking for. What do you believe? Yeah. And then, as you mentioned, then the, the next part being being the outcome, the, the destination. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? Because when we're making a purchasing decision, yeah, we get all wowed up by, you know, maybe we go on and we look at the website and we maybe have a demo of it. Maybe we even take a free trial or whatever it is. And we get all wowed and we think about it. And then, and then we connect with the company. But at this stage, we're probably a little bit overwhelmed and we're talking mm -hmm. to other people and, and that. And I think seeing the connection between what you're looking to buy and, as you say, where that journey then leads you, that I think is the, is often the missing the missing piece. You know, that's not yeah. that's not really addressed. It's addressed in general terms, maybe, but not to a point where you go, "Oh yeah, you you." That's the outcome we're looking for. Yeah, um, outcomes can be tricky. They're not necessarily always what you think they are, as I mentioned before. But when you connect to an what I call the deep outcome, which is really on a deep emotional level. Uh, rather than what I what I call the presenting outcome, right? The presenting outcomes are the typical things that people consider to be uh, benefits, right? It's faster, cheaper, whatever. Uh, mm. Those are presenting outcomes. But why those matter or why your belief system matters more specifically is the deep outcome. And uh, examples of that are, I once worked with a young lady who did a, uh, um, she sold health insurance and does tax prep, right? And she comes to me, it's like, what business am I in? I have no idea. <laughs> and we always work on the belief system first. And her belief system that we uncovered is you have to be financially ready for whatever life throws at you. Oh, so mm -hmm. you're, you're in the financial readiness business, specifically for people who are having an experience of life where life is throwing stuff at them, good and bad, right? Yeah. Uh, so now you know who a big window into the uh, psychographic need of your audience, but also what your belief is it, what your belief is, and also what your outcome is. It's not life insurance. It's not uh, tax prep or even any of the other services that she uh, incorporated. They're coming to you because they want to be financially prepared to handle life. That's the yeah. outcome, right? 
yeah. the presenting and outcomes are all day. Like we're, we'll get these things clarity and in order and you know ease or whatever. But the deep outcome yeah. is that I'm ready. And and if you think about it, I mean, as well, if you you think about when you know the different uh, climates that we're in, you know, market conditions, all of that. Uh, right. The the the. I mean, right now, then risk mitigation obviously is very high on the list. So the trust and the fact that the out that you know that there's not a um that there's a manageable amount of risk attached to the outcome. Perhaps that's going to be depending on you, who you are, and the type of person you want to attract. And I'm a big fan of, you know, everyone's like, I got to do my market research to understand my client. And yes, you do. But before you do that, you have to look inward. You have to know who you are. Plant your flag in the ground and say, this is what this business is all about. Now that you know who you are, you are better equipped to find the people who are going to resonate with that. And lo and behold, those are going to be your ideal clients. I do an exercise with my clients where we uncover what I call the belonging traits of their audience, of their business. And these are the traits that make people like, I'm, I'm this kind of person, right? Deep mm -hmm. psychographic profile. And after we do the belonging traits exercise, I just ask a question, how would you like to work with this person? Like and every person says, oh my God, I love working with this person. You're my favorite. I'm like, of course they are, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's how this works. Because you've heard the saying, like, people don't buy what you do, they buy you. That needs actually an update, to tell you the truth. It's not wrong, it just needs an update. People don't actually buy you. What they are actually are buying is the reflection of themselves they see in you, right? Mm. So what we're talking about is what kind of a mirror are you holding up? And you, as the business owner, you get to, do, to decide what mirror are you holding up? Because that's going to be what determines who sees themselves in that mirror. Yeah, and that's what belonging and, traits do. And and the interesting part of, of that, to, to my mind, is that is you can't have that right. That's where the real authenticity comes in. Oh, yeah. because because eventually, eventually there'll be a disconnect if you're trying to kind of fake. Absolutely. It. Yeah, you're not. You're definitely going to be not okay with some people when you're this specific and targeted but for the people who you are perfect for they're going to see you right away there's going to be no ambiguity and they're ready to say yes almost immediately because you've established a near instant trust with uh, your communication they just want to have a conversation to make sure you're not lying to them <laughs> right <laughs> and uh, when you source your messaging from who you are, from all these deeper psychographic points, uh, a bit of data points, well, you're naturally going to come off as the real deal because it's just who you are. There's no trying to fake it till you make it. And the authenticity that you were talking about before just comes through naturally. Yeah, and 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 that's the important thing. It it, it needs to be natural. Uh, but mm -hmm. from what you're saying, like you know, as a, as a business owner, as a business, uh, uh, I mean, you. This is a conscious, here's a great word that people are throwing around all the time now, is intentionality. Yeah. Um, yes. But, but you, have to be atten in, you have to be intentional about your approach. And this is, this is who you are, yeah. this is your business. And, and be happy that that, as you said, that may exclude some people. Oh, yeah. It's definitely going to exclude some people. And whenever I, I get a client nervous about that, I do a little exercise with them and say, well, who is it going to exclude? this person, that person, so on and so forth. And I look them in the eye and I say, is that the kind of person you want to work with? And then the light goes off like, no, I hate those clients. <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> bonus points, right? <laughs> no, no, absolutely, absolutely. And so tell me, uh, tell me, Michael, um, can you give me some examples, you don't have to name names or anything, but just some examples of, of clients you've worked with and how you have changed their business yeah. by this approach. One of my favorites, because the I'll, I'll give you two if I have time, uh, but one of them yeah, is sure. a uh, a firm that they do data analytics, right? So really in in the head type of uh, uh, people, where their audience, their vertical that they're marketing to are a bunch of uh, mutual insurance companies, okay? And for your audience, mutual insurance companies tend to be very family owned. 
They mm-hmm. serve a tight knit community. They're they're the kind of insurance company where you're they know you by name and you see them at the uh, uh, at the soccer game because their kids are going to the same school as your kids, right? Right. So here's a bunch of data analytics people trying to sell something to a bunch of people who have zero idea of what data analytics is, other than the dictionary definition of the two words, (laughs) much less how it benefits them. Plus, Mm -hmm. get this, the business has been around for a year and a half. They're selling a three-year program, the ROI of which you only see somewhere in the middle of year two. So they haven't even been in business long enough to have a track record that they can point to. And uh, and they're, yet they're saying, hey, set, you know, spend six figures a year on us for something that we have no proof ex- works, except for yeah. anecdote, right? And it also turns out that the seven people responsible for talking to the client at some stage, it's not always the seven, same people, but they were all talking about the business in seven different ways because of how they mm. perceived what this business is about. So in a year and a half from a warm list, uh, they had gotten maybe about two or three clients. Uh, And in like week five of trying to uh, land another client, we worked together, get them all on the same page around the language to be using and what their part within that framework is and the whole thing. Uh, And then I get a call six months later from the CEO saying, hey, Michael, just want to let you know, thank you, we're at client number 10 now and and, and (laughs) going. And this was, it wasn't that the business model was bad or even that the the marketplace that they were going after was wrong. It was a great fit. It was just that they didn't know how to talk to them about it. Right. Because they were coming from two different worlds, data analytics, they're making assumptions. Meanwhile, mutual insurance is like, I have, you might be from Mars. I don't know what the hell you're talking about, (laughs) right? Yeah. So what's all, what right also language. what's what's also fascinating there is the fact you get everybody on the same page, and I think this yeah. is a this is a problem that a lot of companies have because yeah. your perception of the company can be different depending on who you interact with at that company, exactly. and you can get a completely different message from them, and therefore that doesn't build that doesn't build trust because we like consistency. You just nailed it right on the head. If you're hearing a different message along the uh, pathway to working with a company, then the, the creator brain freaks out. Doesn't know who you are, right? Because our brain sees your business as if the business itself were a person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so think of the employees as different personalities within that business or different aspects of personality within that business. And if they're not co- like cohesive or talking about the same thing, our critter brain just goes, what the hell are you all about? Now, we don't know that's why it was happening. It's like, huh, I'm confused or I just don't like these guys is how it gets operationalized language wise. But the feeling behind that, because remember, critter brains just do survival and emotions. Notices, Mm -hmm. oh no, survival's on the line, throws out an emotion about it and the rest (laughs) of our brain has to interpret that. (laughs) <laughs> and so that, that's how we come up with like, mm, I just don't know. There's something about this. that doesn't feel right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. I know, I know a few, I, I know a few people who only use their critter brains as far as I can tell. But, yeah. Right. Um, that's, a, <laughs> that's another story completely. Yeah. That was a, fa- that was a really fascinating example. So yeah, we have time. Let's do, uh, if you could give it the other one you were going to. Sure. Um, you know, I keep talking about beliefs and I want to give you mm-hmm. one example of a client that, not that this was a, um, a particularly unique story is just that the the belief system was kind of fun. Uh, one of my very first clients was a company that makes these uh, cooking gadgets. They sold these cooking gadgets online. Their sales have been stagnant for a while. Their marketing department is like, we have no idea what to do. So they brought me in and I'm working with them and they were a tough nut to crack, but I'm persistent. And um, I'm there with their CEO and the three senior VPs of operations, marketing, and sales. And it's tough going for a while until finally uh, we did a, a certain line of investigation. Like this, I'm pulling on this thread that I knew was interesting. And finally, I get the CEO. He literally slaps his hands on the desk and he goes, I know this is going to make me sound shallow, but I just love, love it when I come to get to a dinner party. 
and I brought my, the food I cooked and everyone's like, oh my God, I can't believe you did this. He's like, I love the attention. <laughs> and everyone else in the room is like, yeah, that's because, no, he's the guy hiring these people, right? Years yeah. ago. And of course he's hiring like kind because we want to be around like kind. Uh, he didn't know he was doing that, but that's what he's doing. So it turns out the primary belief system within this cooking gadget company is literally, it's fun to show off, uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I use this example to say that your belief system in the business does not have to be profound. It just has to be true that like the stars or the heavens don't need to open up and there's a light. Like I've never thought of that before. It's like, no, it can be as shallow as possible. It's fun to show off. I, now, love, I, I love that, Michael. Yeah, and the way this got translated is like now, beliefs by themselves are fantastic, but I go even further and find the meaning behind the belief. And the meaning behind this one is because everyone deserves to feel valued. Okay, now we know what the messaging should be talking about. And this translated into a whole campaign around, do you want to be the star of the dinner party? Now, we didn't say those words exactly. Uh, something like we create dinner party heroes or something like that. Right. But and all the imagery, which is another form of language, right? It's just visual language. So all the imagery is of like people at a dinner party, but there's one person who's the focus of everyone's attention, right? And so they're no longer saying, hey, do you want to buy our gadgets? You know, you, they cook food. It's quick. It's perfect right. every time. Like benefit, 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 right? What they're saying is an identity, a belief system. It's fun to show off. Hey, do you want to be the star of the dinner party? That really, that's the outcome. It ain't the food. It's the, uh, the outcome is everyone looking at you going, holy crap, I, you, you rock this out of the park, that attention, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And from there, we're able to find different places for them to market where their competition ain't anywhere near, which is all like, where do people who crave attention hang out? Let's go talk about <laughs> being a star of the dinner party at those places. And your message now is like left field because they're used to seeing these other messages. And here you are talking about kitchen gadgets or cooking gadgets and being the star of the dinner party. And yeah, these are people who want to be the star of the dinner party. I wasn't thinking about it until you came along and said something, but I'm into it. Next thing you know, sales within the next month, 10% rise month over month because of that. Yeah. I, I just, oh, that's it's another. fun to show off. <laughs> oh, it's fun to show off. And I love that because... Because I do think we live in an era today of, as I said, you know, people are talking about meaning and purpose and all of that. And everybody, yeah. I think, yes, there are some who are, are there are some which are profound and which should be and are great right. and all of that. But to your point is they don't all have to be. And I think, yeah. I think if you went for, as you were saying, with your uh, cooking gadget company, if you went mm -hmm. super profound, that's going to be, there, there's going to be like a complete disconnect. <laughs> yes. There was nothing profound. Well, all businesses are a reflection of the people who run them. They are mm -hmm. literally aspects of self. So if you go out there and say, I've done the market research, I see a hole in the market and they want this. So I'm going to provide that. If that's not part of who you are, oh, we, yeah. at a very early age, we can spot a faker, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. At a very early yeah. age, we are tuned in. We instinctively know when someone is saying something they don't believe. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And it comes out in different ways. It's nonverbal. It's verbal. It's unintentional. It's this, that, the other thing. And so here comes a company. If you're like trying to capture a market with a message that you or a, a, an identity you don't believe in, it's going to come out in how you talk about it in all your marketing and your converse and your networking and your sales. And we pick up on it. We human yeah. beings are incredible BS detectors. And <laughs> what, I mean by, what I mean by BS is belief system. <laughs> right? yeah. We are really good at picking this stuff up and it happens yeah. behind the scenes. It's not really, uh, it's what we call pre-conscious. It's not subconscious, but it's not like in our front and center awareness either. Mm -hmm. um, and we just feel it. This is where all the inauthenticity comes in. Right. Yeah, with all those yeah. influence saying, I'm authentic, I'm this, I'm that. And, and there's something else like, no, mm. you're not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? If you have to, if you have to say you're authentic or you have to work on being right. authentic, then right. yeah. that should be. Yeah, you have to say you're cool, you, you ain't know. cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 Yeah. Hey, listen, uh, Michael, this has been fantastic. All of Michael's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people yeah. a little bit more about you and what you do. 
Sure. So uh, essentially, uh, I work with two kinds of clients, uh, small businesses, even solopreneurs. They come to me saying, how do I talk about my business? I, I am in, I'm doing the networking. I'm doing the marketing. It's not landing. How do I talk to people? That's number one. Uh, and I also work with mid-market companies. These are the small end of mid-market. Uh, aligning their sales and marketing teams around the language they're using so that they are cohesive. So they are talking about the business the same way because from the customer's point of view, that's one company, right? <laughs> Not two different silos, <laughs> right? No, I, I love it. I, I've, I've kept saying this every time I talk, any, every time the subject of sales and marketing alignment comes up, yeah. I always just love to say is, now I can say 2023, and we're still talking about that. Interesting, yeah. isn't it? Like you know, yeah. every year it's like sales and marketing alignment, and it seems to be an, yeah. an ongoing issue, which is kind of baffling. It is, way. and I've discovered it has less to do with processes and more to do with how marketing departments perceive the business and how sales departments perceive the business. And what I do is I get them understanding each other and the business in the same way so they can operate as a cohesive unit rather than silos, Absolutely. usually pointing fingers so at each sound, other. Yeah, exactly. If that sounds like your sales and marketing, you need to reach to Michael. Um, this is fantastic. As I said, all Michael's information will be below this video. This is fascinating stuff, and I would really, really Thank encourage you. you to go and, and check it out. Could revolutionize your year. You get to yeah. get your hell yeah value proposition. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hell what yeah. makes someone say, hell yeah, I want that. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, thanks, Michael. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you, John.